So uh, I'm, Mike asked me to talk a little bit about um, adjuvant plating, uh, which I will do. Uh, my first disclaimer is there is even less science in this talk than in most of the other ones. Um, and we have to think about what we mean by adjuvant. So the definition, first and foremost, comes from the need to aid, to assist, or serving to contribute <coughs> to a fixation in this instance. Some fractures maybe need a little help. Um, and so the disclaimer here is that if you try this, you may find you need to uh, take a little heed, take a little caution. But if you get it right, it can be really quite enjoyable. Um, so adjuvant plates, they can be used to aid fracture reduction. They can be used to alter the mechanics of a fracture in either acute fracture surgery or in non-union surgery. And we can use them in a sort of fragment-specific mode. So this is kind of my distillate of what I think the modes of use for the plates in this instance, in this instance might be. Kit, what do you need for this? Um, typically, we use sort of lots of mini fragment, compact handsets and so on, but actually, small fragment set does a lot of the work for you as well with this. So you don't need the latest whiz-bang technology necessarily. What it isn't. So using a plate to help another, it's not like that, okay, where you've got I don't know which is the adjuvant and which is the real plate in this instance, but there are some principles, Bob doesn't like the word, but rules of engagement that you must obey when we're using additional plates in surgery. So let's look at fracture reduction and adjuvant plate. The classic is the proximal tibial fracture, um, preventing that flexion moment, using the plate to reduce the fracture, allowing for a nail passage. Yeah, that's fine, and we've seen that before. Personally now, I think with extended leg nailing, that need for that plate has, has waned a little. Um, and we've all been familiar with the use of clamps. So this is something we do, and you can use clamps to hold your fractures reduced. I, I find every now and again, you're doing one of these, and every time you pass the reamer down, the clamp pops off, or it's fiddly and the clamp slips, or you're struggling to get that, and you end up a bit in a moment like Basil Fawlty, where the blooming clamp just won't stay where it's meant to be, and it's quite irritating. And so, especially in the open fractures, why not pop a little plate on and hold the fracture reduced for you while you nail it? So here we've got a large butterfly, quite difficult to necessarily hold it in place while the nail's going down, tight young adult canal, and envisaging the clamps popping off. So we use the plate biased anteriorly on the cortex and it allows the passage of the nail past it and then you remove the plate at the end of the uh, nailing procedure. It's fast. It allows you to accurately maintain a reduction during the operation. It's reliable. And the bone's staring at you. So that's a good use in open fractures. Non-union. Uh, so this is one with a broken plate. Um, so we've removed the hardware. And we've used a little plate just to hold the fracture reduced while you're nailing it. You can leave that plate on if you want. I put it to you that the 2.7 plate with four tiny screws is going to do nothing to the strain environment of that sort of non-union with a big nail up the middle. It's like a bone suture or an internal external fixator, and you can leave it impossible. <coughs> so that's reducing fractures. What about fixing fractures in a sort of fragment-specific manner? I think... Some fractures need that. You know, no one plate can necessarily fix every fracture in every pre-contoured anatomic area, area of the body. So here's a, here's a plateau. This is quite an interesting case because he's got quite a significant tuberosity fragment. He's got a lot of fragmentation to the lateral cortex and a lot of displacement of the lateral condyle. So it's a way. It's not the only way. But for me, fixing this in a fragment-specific way, so we've buttress the lateral corner, we've got a rim plate to support those periarticular fragments, and we've done a tension band to the tuberosity. Allows him to early motion. Okay, there's a second plate on the side of the tuberosity just to give it some additional support. Very low profiles compared to two big screws through the tuberosity. Soft tissue friendly. Um, just beware, you can be expensive in drill bits with little 2.7 plates, so that's part of that learning curve as well. But Mike wanted me to talk a bit more about mechanics than anything. I think when you look at the mechanics, you've got to think about the load transmission going through the bone you're dealing with. And different bones have different mechanical environments. So we've seen a uh, discussion earlier today in the breakout session about the femur. And we'll touch again on that for those that weren't there. The tibia, which we are all very familiar with, and the upper limb, which is subject to a very different load to the lower limb. So let's look at the femur load transmission 
inherently inverus, okay? so a mechanically unfavorable environment for fracture fixation. So here's the classic, this lady, 45, female, a little bit cuddly, and she's got previous form. There's an old tibial plateau fracture there, um, but you know it's a fairly standard distal femoral fracture, but note that that medial comminution, okay, that's, that's a danger sign for the distal femoral fracture. So my preference in this situation is a laterally based plate as normal, but apply a supplementary medial plate to give you that confidence in the immediate post-operative full weight bearing. Okay, and we saw this a lot with uh, Tim and Nigel's talk earlier. And this is just a 3.5 small fragment plate. And there you go, perfect alignment afterwards. It was interesting, we were discussing, so those are lock screws. And I old, old slide, wouldn't use, but look at that. It's anatomic, but the plate doesn't sit on properly. So I might have the plate in the wrong place, or I don't think the fracture's reduced pro uh, un improperly. So I'd be interested to see what you think, Tim. But we'll talk later. <laughs> 80, female, proximal femur. So we're seeing this more in the periprosthetic. This is a difficult one. Proximal femur, really long cement mantle, all the way down to pretty much the knee, and a split into the distal femur there. Really difficult. This is at six weeks down the line. She'd been treated in a plaster, and she'd now slowly drifted into valgus. Um, so a challenging one. And again, immediate full weight bearing with the use of an augmented plate. Here we've taken a bit of the cement mantle out and distal, a uh, dime dialed the uh, distal block onto the shaft, and then that little supplementary medial plate. For me, that medial femur plate, that augment, you have to think about the way you're using it. Is it your first plate, in which case it's a buttress, it's reducing things, it's giving you your read, or is it an antivirus collapse plate? Is it changing the mechanical environment for your laterally based fixation? You've got to think about how you put the hardware in. So. I personally am trying as much as possible to get the lateral plate in minimally invasively, and then I'll do a little medial subvastus approach, extra periostally apply that plate. You can do both through a midline, biologically friendly, and you've got to therefore have the confidence to immediately fully weight bear your patient. <coughs> Upper limb, a bit different. So here we've open transelectronon fracture dislocation. And, you know, there's a bit of bone loss here. 70 years old, osteoporotic, and for me, a standard pre-contoured periarticular plate, but there's a segment of bone missing, and additional little lateral plate to that construct gives me the confidence to get it moving, to get it going. And here's the two-week post-op, and by 10 weeks, that piece is filled in, and he's been using it immediately. So it changes the mechanics, that load on that plate. And then we go to the humerus. So this was a case, uh, 65, uh, had a plate, anterolateral, fell on the ward in about five weeks, early failure, no infection, um, but parotic, long span now of unsupported humerus, difficult uh, think of the reconstruction. We've got medial defect, and we've got parotic bone. So for me, this was just an example of a case but we've got a long phylos plate, biologically friendly fixation, and then we've got that medial defect still, so that long plate's at risk of failure. <laughs> we've got that long bridge span, those screws between the arrowheads are outside the plate, but all we've got on the anterior plate is just two screws at each end. Just changing the mechanical forces on that long lateral plate, and it goes on to union. So the heavy metal, doesn't mean biological abuse. You have to apply it in a friendly way. So the adjuvant plates for me, you can use them in these ways. I think the kit, yeah, you, need, you can choose what you like. You don't need expensive stuff. You need to think about the mechanics, the way you're using the plates. But there are some rules of engagement. So think about the mechanical force on each fragment of bone or the mechanical force on your construct. But be friendly, the biology counts. Logic prevails, but Bob will agree with that. So use what's right for the right situation. But actually, you know, despite all those slides, most fractures still just need a standard fixation. So uh, I'll leave you with that. Thank you. Thank you.